Welcome back to another IB Environmental Systems and Societies video. This is part two of our exploration of ESS topic 3.2, Human Impacts on Biodiversity. In this video, we'll examine how scientists classify species according to their extinction risk, and we're going to explore conservation efforts around the world. So let's get into it. The International Union for Conservation of Nature, or IUCN, assesses the global conservation status of species through its famous Red List. This assessment system standardizes how we evaluate extinction risk based on scientific criteria. These criteria include population size, the rate that population size changes, breeding potential, geographic range, and known threats to that species. The IUCN status provides valuable information that allows governments, conservation organizations, and individuals to prioritize protection efforts and develop appropriate management strategies. The IUCN Red List has grown substantially since its creation. As you can see in this graph, assessments have increased from just 34 species in 1959 to over 157,000 species in 2023. This dramatic increase reflects both growing conservation concern and improved scientific capabilities. However, it's important to note that this represents only a tiny fraction of all known species. Many taxonomic groups remain poorly studied, especially in vertebrates, fungi, and plants. The growing assessment database helps identify patterns of extinction risk across different regions and taxonomic groups. The IUCN Red List uses these color-coded categories to classify species based on their risk of extinction. This system creates a standardized way to communicate how threatened a species is. The categories range from least concern in blue-green to extinct in black, with increasing levels of threat as we move through the spectrum. These classifications help conservationists decide where to focus their limited resources and track how species are responding to protection efforts. Let's look at the first two categories. Species labeled least concern are widespread and abundant. These animals and plants face no immediate risk of extinction because they have large staple populations and they don't face significant threats. Think of common birds like robins or pigeons. Near threatened species are doing okay for now, but they are showing some warning signs. They're experiencing some population declines or facing new emerging threats. They're not yet threatened, but they could become so in the near future if we don't monitor them carefully. The American bison is one example. Their populations have increased, but they do remain vulnerable to future threats. Moving into the threatened categories, we see a progression of risk. Vulnerable species face a high risk of extinction in the wild if current conditions continue. They've experienced significant population declines or habitat loss. Endangered species face an even higher risk with rapidly shrinking populations or very limited ranges. The African elephant is endangered because poaching continues to reduce its numbers drastically. Critically endangered represents the highest risk category before extinction. These species are in immediate danger of disappearing forever. They often have tiny populations and they face multiple serious threats at the same time. The final categories represent complete failure of conservation efforts. Extinct in the wild means a species survives only in captivity, in zoos, in aquariums, or in botanical gardens. The wild population has completely vanished, as happened with a Hawaiian crow. Extinct is the final, irreversible category. No individuals remain anywhere on Earth. The dodo bird and the passenger pigeon are classic examples of extinct species. Once a species reaches this point, its unique genetic information and ecological role are lost forever. Conservation status helps different stakeholders decide where to focus their efforts. Different groups approach conservation from unique perspectives. National governments establish protected areas and pass laws to protect species. NGOs run research programs, breeding centers, and advocacy campaigns. Individual citizens make choices about consumption, they participate in citizen science, and they may support local conservation initiatives. Each group has different resources and priorities, but they all play crucial roles in protecting biodiversity. Governments typically approach conservation by balancing economic development with environmental protection. They create national parks, enforce wildlife laws, and represent their countries in international agreements. However, they often face political and economic pressures that limit conservation actions. Brazil's approach to the Amazon rainforest illustrates this challenge. The government has to balance the economic benefits of development with the ecological importance of preserving the world's largest rainforest. This balancing act shows how economic interests often compete with conservation goals. Non-governmental organizations focus primarily on ecosystem preservation. They have more flexibility than governments in their approaches and their funding models. 
Groups like the WWF use scientific research to guide conservation strategies, and they often highlight charismatic species like pandas to gain public support. NGOs can mobilize international resources and public awareness through campaigns, through research, and through direct conservation action. Their focus on specific species and habitats often creates more targeted conservation programs than government efforts can. Individual citizens connect with conservation through emotional attachments to specific animals or natural places. Our perspectives are shaped by cultural values and personal experiences. For a refresher on how people's perspectives are shaped, watch my video about environmental value systems. While we may have limited resources compared to governments or NGOs, individuals often engage in direct conservation actions like habitat restoration or wildlife monitoring. On the flip side, People may not engage in conservation efforts because of their economic situation or because they prioritize human wants and needs over natural ecosystems. People are frequently motivated by aesthetic or recreational connections to nature. Individual activists have played important roles in protecting species like the golden lion tamarind by raising awareness and changing public opinion about conservation priorities. Conservation often involves conflicts between different stakeholders' priorities. In the Amazon rainforest, government perspectives might emphasize economic development through resource extraction for the Brazilian voters who brought them to power, while NGOs focus on ecosystem protection and indigenous rights, and they have pressure from external sources outside of Brazil. Individual perspectives might value biodiversity preservation and cultural heritage. These differences create tensions between economic development and ecological preservation short-term gains versus long-term sustainability, and local community needs versus global conservation goals. Resolving these conflicts requires compromise and understanding of different perspectives. Let's take a look at several species whose case studies demonstrate varying degrees of conservation success or failure. First, let's look at some tragic examples of extinction caused by humans. The passenger pigeon once darkened the skies of North America in flocks of billions of birds, Despite this abundance, market hunting and habitat destruction drove them to extinction by 1914. This case of the passenger pigeon demonstrates how even incredibly numerous species can disappear when we exploit them faster than they can reproduce. The Tasmanian tiger or thylacine was a unique marsupial predator with a wolf-like appearance. It was systematically hunted due to perceived threats to livestock until the last individual died in captivity in the 1930s. This extinction shows how fear and misunderstanding can lead to the deliberate elimination of species. The Caribbean monk seal disappeared in the 1950s after centuries of hunting for oil and blubber. European colonizers killed these seals in huge numbers and their entire range in the Caribbean was heavily impacted by human activities. Their extinction left a gap for marine ecosystems throughout the region. Stellar sea cow was a remarkable marine mammal discovered in 1741 in the North Pacific Ocean. Within just 27 years of its scientific discovery, it was hunted to extinction for meat, fat, and hide. This rapid extinction highlights how vulnerable slow reproducing species are to human exploitation. Today, many species faced similar threats. The vaquita porpoise is the most endangered marine mammal on Earth, with fewer than 20 individuals remaining in Mexico's Gulf of California. They're caught accidentally in fishing nets that are targeting the valuable totuaba fish. Despite international attention and protection efforts, their population continues to decline. The Javan rhino is restricted to a single population in Indonesia's Ujong Kulon National Park, with fewer than 70 individuals. Poaching for their horns and habitat loss have driven this species to the brink of extinction. Their limited range makes them vulnerable to disease or to natural disasters. The Amur leopard is one of the world's most endangered big cats, with fewer than 100 individuals in the Russian Far East and northeastern China. Their spotted coats make them targets for poachers, while habitat fragmentation isolates their populations and limits their genetic diversity. The Kekapo is a flightless parrot found only in New Zealand, and there's only about 200 of them left in the wild. These unusual birds evolved without mammalian predators, which makes them extremely vulnerable to introduced cats and rats. The Kakapo's slow reproduction rate, they breed only over two to four years, makes their recovery particularly challenging. Not all conservation stories end in tragedy. The Arabian oryx once roamed the Arabian Peninsula, but was driven extinct in the wild by 1972 due to hunting. However, through captive breeding programs and reintroduction efforts, several wild populations have been reestablished. 
their status has improved from extinct in the wild to vulnerable. That's a remarkable conservation success. The black-footed ferret was declared extinct in the wild in the 1980s after prairie dog populations were decimated because prairie dogs is the ferret's main source of prey. A small population of the black-footed ferret was discovered and captive breeding programs have established multiple wild populations since then. While they're still listed as endangered, their numbers are slowly increasing. The Mauritius kestrels population crashed to just four known birds in the wild in the 1970s due to DDT poisoning and habitat loss. Through intensive captive breeding, habitat protection, and predator control, their population has grown to over 400 individuals. This recovery shows how dedicated conservation can save species even from the brink of extinction. The California condor, North America's largest bird, was reduced to just 27 birds when I was a kid in the 1980s. A controversial decision to capture all remaining wild condors for breeding is what saved the species. Today, over 300 condors exist, with more than half of them flying free in the wild. Lead poisoning from ammunition remains a challenge for their full recovery, but their population is growing. The southern white rhino was nearly extinct in the early 1900s, with fewer than 50 of them remaining in South Africa. Protected reserves and anti-poaching efforts have helped the population of white rhinos recover to over 20,000 individuals, making it the only rhino species not endangered today. This success shows that large mammal conservation can work with sufficient protection. These conservation challenges connect to a concept called the tragedy of the commons. This describes what happens when many people have unrestricted access to a shared resource. Since each user gets all the benefits from exploiting the resource, but shares the costs with everybody else, individuals are motivated to take as much as possible. This rational individual behavior leads to collective disaster, resource depletion, and environmental degradation. The concept helps explain why shared resources like fisheries, forests, and clean air are often overexploited despite their importance to everybody. The tragedy of the commons operates through a specific mechanism. Benefits go to individual users, while costs are distributed among all users. This creates incentives for overexploitation, and it often triggers feedback loops that accelerate resource depletion. Common resources share key characteristics. Their use reduces availability for others, many users have access, and access is hard to control. This dynamic challenges long-term resource management and creates tension between individual and collective interests. Examples like the Grand Bank's cod collapse in the North Atlantic Ocean and Amazon deforestation show how this tragedy continues to unfold today. Human impacts on biodiversity involve complex interactions between direct threats, indirect pressures, and social systems. Understanding these relationships allows us to develop effective conservation strategies. The IUCN Red List helps us track species status and prioritize conservation efforts. Different stakeholders bring different perspectives and resources to conservation work. And by learning from both extinction failures and recovery successes, we can make better decisions about protecting Earth's biodiversity in the future. Until next time, happy learning.